live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering IBM Think 2018. Brought to you by IBM. Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE here at IBM Think in Las Vegas, the Mandalay Bay. I'm John Furrier, the host of theCUBE. We're here in this CUBE Studios, the set for IBM Think. My next guest is Jennifer Shin, who's the founder of Eight Path Solutions. Um, Twitter handle, Jen, J-S-H-I-N. Great to see you, thanks for joining me. Yeah, happy to be here. I'm glad you stopped by, I wanted to get your thoughts. You're a thought leader in the industry. You've been on multiple CUBE uh, panels. Thank you very much, I also CUBE alumni. Um, you know, IBM with the data, center of the value proposition, you know, the CEO's up on stage today saying, you get data and you got blockchain and you got AI, which is essentially infrastructure of the future, yep. and AI is software of the future, data's at the middle. Dave and I were talking about that as the innovation sandwich. The data is being sandwiched between blockchain and AI, two super important things, and she also mentioned Moore's Law, mm -hmm. faster, smaller, cheaper, every six months doubling in speed and performance, and then Metcalf's Law, which is more of a network effect. Kind of teasing out token economics, you see kind of where the world's going. This is, this is interesting positioning from IBM. I love when I like it. Um, is it real? <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds very data science-y, right? You have the economics part, you have the you know networking, you have all these things interplaying. So I think it's very much in line with what you would expect if data science actually sustains itself, which thankfully it has. Yeah. Um, and I think it, the reality is, you know, we like to boil things down into nice little simple concepts, but in the real world, when you're actually figuring it all out, it's yeah. going to be multiple effects. It's going to be you know a lot of different things that interact. And they kind of really teased out their cloud strategy in a very elegant way. I mean. They essentially said, look it, we're into the cloud and we're not going to try to, they didn't say it directly, but they basically said it. We're not going to compete with Amazon head to head. We're going to let our offerings do the talking. We're going to use data and give customers choice with multi-cloud. How does that jive for you? How does that, how does that work? Because at the end of the day, I got to have business logic. I need applications. Yes. You know, whether it's blockchain, cryptocurrency, or apps, the killer apps now money. Yep. If no one's making any money, <laughs> sure. you know, no commerce is being done. Right. I mean, I think it makes sense. Uh, you know, Amazon has such a strong hold in, in the infrastructure part, right? Being able to store your data elsewhere and have it be cloud. I don't think that was really IBM's core business. Um, you know, a lot of, I think, their business model is built around business to business relationships. And these days, one of the great things about all these data technologies is that one, one company doesn't have to do all of it, right? You have partnerships and actually partners so that, you know, one company does AI, you partner with another company that has data, and that way you can actually both make money. Right? There's more than enough work to go around, and that much you can say having worked with data science teams, right? <laughs> Right? If I can offload some of my work to different divisions, fantastic. Yeah. That'd be great. So yeah, so it's time, we get to market faster, you know, can build things quicker. Yeah. So I think that's one of the great things about what's happening with data these days, right? There's enough work yeah. to get around. And it's beautiful too because you think if you think about the concept of what cloud made cloud great is DevOps. Yeah. Blockchain is an opportunity to use decentralization to take away a lot of inefficiencies. AI is also an automation opportunity to create value. So you got inefficiencies on the blockchain side and AI to create value. Your thoughts and reaction to where that's going to go, you know, and in light of the first death of an Uber self-driving car, right. again historic yesterday, right? So, you know, the reality is right there. We're not perfect, yeah, but there's, there's a path. Well, so most of the inefficiency out there, it's not the technology. It's all the people using technology, right? You broke the logic by putting in something you shouldn't have put into that data set. You know, there's the data is now dirty because you put in things that. The you know developer didn't think that you put in there. So the reality is we're going to keep making mistakes, and there'll be more and more opportunities for new technologies to help you know help help chew that up. And so I was talking with Rob Thomas, GM of the analytics team. You know mm -hmm. Rob, great yep. guy. Uh, he's smart. He's a, he's also an executive, but he knows the tech. He and I are talking about this notion of data containers. Mm -hmm. So with Kubernetes now front and center as an orchestration layer for cloud and application workloads, IBM has an interesting announcement with this cloud private approach, right. where data is, is the central thing in this. Because you got things like GDPR out there and the regulatory environment is not going to get any easier. You got blockchain, crypto, that's a regulatory nightmare. We know a GDPR, that's a total nightmare. So this is happening, right? So what are, what should customers be doing? I mean, in, in, in your experience, um, customers are scratching their head. They don't want to make a wrong bet, but they need good data, good strategy. They need to do things differently. How do they get the best out of their data architecture, knowing that there's hurdles and potential blockers in front of them? 
Well, so I think you want to be careful what you select and how, how much you're going to be indebted to that one service that you selected, right? So if you're not sure yet, maybe you don't invest all of your budget into this one, one thing that you're not sure is going to really be what you want to be paying for in a year or two, right? So I think being really yeah. open to how you're, going to how you're going to plan for things long term and thinking about where you can have some flexibility, whereas certain things you can. For instance, if you're going to be in an industry that is going to be you know, strict on regulatory requirements, Right, then you, you have less legal room than, say, an industry where that's not going to be as much of a, an absolute necessary part of your technology. Let me ask you a, a question, being kind of a, a historian, it has a, you know, what's it, one year is like seven dog years or whatever the expression is yep. in the data space. It just seems like yesterday that Hadoop was going to save the world. Yep. Um, so that, as kind of context, what, what is some technologies that just didn't pan out? Is, it the, is the data lake working? I mean, what's, what, what didn't work? and what replaced it, if you can make an observation? Well, so I think that's hard, because the way I understood technology is probably not the way everyone else did, right? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, Hadoop, it just is like a way of being able to store data, right? And, and being able to use, uh, you know, more, more information store faster, but I'll tell you what I think is hilarious. I see people using Hadoop and then running SQL queries the same way we did like 10 plus years ago, same inefficiency, and they're not leveraging the fact that it's Hadoop. Right, they're treating it like I'm going to create eight million tables and then use joins. So they're not really using the technology. I think that's probably the biggest disappointment is that without yeah. knowledge sharing, without education, yeah. you have people making the same mistakes we made when technology wasn't as efficient. I mean, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, I guess, if that's right. the expression. Okay, so on the on the exciting side, what are you excited about in technology right now? What are you looking at that's a you know the next 20 mile stair of potential goodness that could be coming out of the industry? So I think anytime you have better science, better measurement. So measurement's huge, right? If you think about media industry, right? Everyone's trying to measure. I think there was an article that came out about some of YouTube's failures about measurement, right? And, and I think in general, right, Facebook is you know very well known for measurement. That's going to be really interesting to see, right? What methodologies come out in terms of how well can we measure? I think another one would be, say, targeted advertising, right? That's another huge market that you know, a lot of companies are going after. Um, I think what's really going to be cool in the next few years is to see what people come up with, right? It's really yeah. the human ingenuity of it, right? We have the technology now, we have data engineers, what can we actually build and how are we going to partner to be able to do that? And there's new stacks that are developing. The thing about the e-commerce stack, it's a 30-year-old stack, um, and ad tech and DNS and cooking. Now you've got social and network effects going on. Yeah. You know, mentioned the Medcalf's law. Um, so with all that, I want to get your, your, just your personal thoughts on um, blockchain beyond blockchain, token economics. Yeah. Because there are a lot of people who are doing stuff with crypto, mm -hmm. but what's really kind of pointing as a megatrend standpoint is a new class of decentralized application developers are coming in. Right. Okay, they're dealing with data now on a, on a decentralized basis. At the heart of that is the token economics, which is changing some of the business model dynamics. Have you seen anything, your thoughts on, on token economics? So I haven't seen it from the economic standpoint. I've seen it more from the sort of the, uh, I guess the algorithms and, and that standpoint. I actually have a good friend of mine who's at Yale and she actually runs the, she's executive director of their corporate law center. So I hear some from her on the legal side. I think what's really interesting is that there's all these different arenas, legal being a very important component with blockchain. Mm -hmm. As well as from the mathematical standpoint, you know, when I was in school way back when, we studied things like, you know, hash keys and, yeah. you, know, you know, RSA keys. And so from the math standpoint, that's also a really cool aspect of yeah. it. So I think what, it's probably too early to say for sure what the economics part is going to actually look like. I think mm -hmm. that's something a little more long-term. But what is exciting about this is that you actually see different, different parts of businesses, right? Not just the you know, financial sector, but also the legal sector, and then you know, say the yeah. math and, and algorithms, and, and yeah. you know, having that integration of being able to build cooler things for that reason. Yeah, the math's certainly exciting. Machine yeah. learning, obviously, you know, that's well documented the growth and success of what, and certainly the interest are there. You're seeing Amazon celebrating um, all the time. I just saw Vernon Vogels, the CTO, talking about another SageMaker uh, yeah. success. They're looking at machine learning that way. You got Google with TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. You got this goodness in, this, in these libraries now that are now in the community. It's kind of a perfect storm of innovation. What's, what's new in the ML world that developers are getting excited about, that companies are harnessing for value? You seeing anything there? Can you share some commentary on, on, the, on the current machine learning trends? So I think a lot of companies have gotten a little more adjusted to the idea of ML. I think in the beginning everyone was like, oh, this is all new, they loved the idea of it, but they didn't really know what they were doing. Right now they know a little bit more. Um, I think in general everyone's really, everyone thinks deep learning is really cool, neural networks. I think what's interesting though is that everyone's trying to figure out where's the line, what's the difference between AI versus machine learning versus deep learning versus yeah. 
neural networks. Yeah. I think it's a little bit fun for me just to see everyone <laughs> kind of struggle a little bit and, <laughs> and actually even know the terminology so we can have a conversation. Yeah. So I think, the, you know, all of that, right? Just yeah. anything related to that sort of, you know, what, when do you use TensorFlow? What do you use it for? And then also even, say, from Google, right? Which parts do you actually send through an API? I mean, that's some of the conversations that I've been having yeah. with people in the business industry. Like, which parts do you send to an API? Which parts do you actually have in-house versus, you know, being able to outsource out? And that's really kind of, you're thinking there is what, around core competencies where people need to kind of own it and really build the core competency and then outsource where it's more ephemeral in value? Is that, or is there a formula, I guess, to know when to bring it in-house and build around? Right. What's your thoughts there? Well, part of it, I think, is scalability. If you don't have the resources or the time, right, sometimes time, if you don't have the time to build it in-house, it, it does make sense to actually outsource it out. Also, if you don't think that's part of your core business, developing that within in-house to, you know, spending all that money and resources yeah. to hire the best data scientists may not be worth it, because in fact, maybe the majority of your actual sales is with the sales department. I mean, they're the ones that actually yeah. bring in that revenue. So I think it's finding that balance of what investment's actually worth it. And sometimes personnel could leave, and then you could be oh, yeah. a big problem. You know, someone walks out the door, gets a, another job because it's a hot commodity to be. That's actually one of the big complaints I've heard is that you know we spent all this time investing in certain young people and then they leave. Yeah. So I think I think part of this is actually that human factor. How do you encourage them to stay? So talk about um, let's talk about you. How did you get here? Um, school interest? Did you go off the path? Did you come in from another vector? How did you get into what you're doing now? And share a little bit about uh, who you are. Yeah, so I studied economics, mathematics, creative writing as an undergrad and statistics as a grad student. So, you know, kind of perfect storm. Natural math, bring yeah. it all together. But, you know, it's funny because I actually wrote about and, and talked about how data is going to be this big thing. This was like 2009, 2010. You know, people didn't think it was that important. You know, yeah, I was yeah. like, the next three to five years, mathematicians, bring me a hot hire. Yeah, yeah. No one believed me. So I ended up going, okay, well, the economy crashed. I was yeah. in management consulting, in finance, private equity hedge funds. Everyone swore, like, if you do this, you're going to be set for life, right? You're on the path, you'll make money. And the economy crashed, all the jobs went away. And I went, maybe not the best career choice for me. Yeah. So I did what I did at companies. I looked at the market and I went, where's their growth? I saw tech had growth and decided I'm going to pick up some skills I've never had before, learn to develop more, learn. I mean, in the beginning, I had no idea what an application development process was, right? Like, <laughs> I'm like, what does that mean to yeah, actually yeah, develop yeah. an application? Um, so the last few years, I've really just been spending, just learning these yeah. things. And what's really cool, though, is last year, one of my patents went through. And I was able to actually launch something with Box at their keynote. So that, that was really awesome. Awesome. So it came a long way from just, I think, having the academic knowledge to being able to apply it and then learn the technologies yeah, yeah. and then developing the technology. Yeah, and that's cool a good thing. path because you came in with a clean sheet paper. You didn't have any dogma of waterfall and yeah. you know, older, older technology. So you kind of jumped in. Did you, did you use like a cloud to build on? Was it Amazon? Was oh, it? Well, that's funny too. Actually, I do know legacy technology quite well because I was in corporate America. Oh, okay, before, so you know. Yeah, so like SQL, for instance, like when I was, when I started working data science, which Funny enough, we didn't call it data science, we just called it like whatever you call it. You know, there was no data science term at that point. Um, you know, we didn't have that, you know, idea of like what, which, whether you use R or Python. I mean, I've used R over 10 years, but it was for statistics. It was never for like, you know, actual data science work. Yeah. And then we used SQL in corporate America. When I was, when I was taking data science, like in 2012, around then, everyone swore that no, no, they're going to be programmers. You got to know programming. To which I'm like, really? In corporate America, you're going to programmers? I mean, think of how long it's going to take to get yeah. someone to learn any language. And of course, now everyone's learning Excel and yeah. SQL again, right? So. Isn't it fun to like, when you see someone on Facebook or LinkedIn, oh man, data's a new oil. And then you say, yeah, here's a blog post I wrote in 2009. Right, <laughs> yep, exactly. Well, so funny enough, uh, Ginny Rometty today was saying about exponential versus linear. And that's one of the things I've been saying over the last year yeah. about, you know, you want exponential growth, because linear, anyone can yeah. do. That's a tweak, that's not really growth. Well, we value uh, your opinion. You've been great on theCUBE, great to help us out on those panels. Um, got a great view. Um, what's going on with your company? What are you working on now? What's exciting you these days? Yeah, so one of the cool things we worked on, I think it, it's very much in line with what the IBM announcement was about being smarter, right? So I developed some technology in the photo industry, digital asset management, as well as just being able to automate the renaming of files, right? So you think, you probably put it in your digital camera, you never moved over, because yeah. I don't remember the process, you open it, you rename it, you save it, you open yeah. the next. And sometimes it's the same number, I got the same version files, it's a nightmare. Exactly, so I basically automated that process of having all of that just automatically renamed. So the demo that I did had 120 photos, we renamed in less than two minutes, right? Just making it faster yeah. and smarter. So really developing technologies that you can actually use every day and, and leverage for things like photography and some cooler stuff with OCR, which is the long-term goal, to be able to mm -hmm. allow photographers to never touch the computer and have all of their clients' photos automatically uploaded, renamed, and sent to the right locations. Instantly. How did you get to how did you get to start that app? Just are you into photography? Or no. was more of 
I have a picture problem and I got to fix it? Or well, actually, it's funny. I had a photographer taking my picture, and then she showed me what she does in the process. I went, "This is this is not okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can do better than this." Yeah. So I, I I can code. So I basically went to Python and went, "All right, I think this could work." Yeah. Built a proof of concept and then decided to patent it. Awesome. Well, congratulations on the patent. Um, final thoughts here with IBM Think. Overall sentiment of the show, Ginny's keynote, do you get a chance to check anything out? What's the hallway conversations like? What are some of the things that you're hearing? So I think there's a general excitement about what might be coming, right? So a lot of the people who are here are actually here to, I think, share notes, right? What's, they want to know what everyone else is doing. So that's actually great. You get to see more people here who are actually interested in this, in this technology. I think there's a, probably some questions about alignment, about where does everything fit. That seems to be a lot of the conversation here. Um, it's much bigger this year, as I'm sure you've noticed, yeah, right? Yeah. It's a lot bigger. So that's probably the biggest thing I've heard. Like, there's yeah. so many more people than we expected there to be. So. I like the Big Ten events, been a fan of it. I think if I was going to be criti critical, I would say they should do a business event and do a technical one yep. under the same kind of theme yep. and bring more alpha geeks to the technical one mm -hmm. and make this much more of the business conversation because the business transformation seems to be the hottest thing here, but I want to get into the down in the weeds, right, you know, right. get down and dirty. So I would like to see two. Yeah, that's I mean, my, my take. I think it's really hard to, to cater to both. Like whenever I give a talk, I don't give a really nerdy talk to say a business crowd. I don't give a really business talk to a nerdy crowd. You know, it's, it's just hard. you have to know, right? It, it, I think they both have a very different sensibility. So really, if you want to have a successful talk, generally you want both. Jennifer, thanks so much for coming by and spending some time in the cube. Great to see you, and thanks for sharing your insights. Jennifer Shin here inside the cube at IBM Think 2018. I'm John Furrier, host of the cube. We're back with more coverage after this short break.